morning. Please respond in the call to worship. Somebody said that if I talk too much about Jesus, people will call me a holy roller. But, Jesus, but because Jesus was on my side, I am here today, and I will talk about his goodness until the day I die. Let the people keep on calling us holy rollers. But if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be today? In this place, we have permission to speak freely about the Lord, about what the Lord has done for us. Yes, many of us come up short on the ramp this month, but somehow God saw us through. Tests came, came and, and tests went, went, went this week, week but, but we passed the most important test of all, the test of faith. Our opening hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns, number 327, and please stand if you are able. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. 
We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to who, though, who obey him. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. At this time, we'll have the children sung.
Anybody else here tell about what you believe? Interesting. Okay. Okay. You took care of me in Vietnam. We did move left, move right, move over, move right past your head. <laughs> and he took care of you all. Awesome. He took care of me all right. Still yeah. Here. Still here. It can be really scary to tell people about what you believe with your faith. But the more we practice it, the better we get at it. So when we practice in front of people that it's safe, then maybe we get more practice and we get we be, we are able to be braver when we're out with people who don't know if they believe or not. So I'm going to give you a pencil today to remind you that part of your job is to teach other people about Jesus. All right, let's pray. Loving God, thank you for helping our faith grow stronger, even when we might be a little bit nervous about it. Help guide us when it comes to having difficult talks with people about Jesus and what we believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, would you open our eyes that we might see, open our ears that we might hear, and open our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I have a question for all of you today. Would you rather listen to me preach, or would you rather share joys and concerns for the sermon today? Anybody have a preference? Do your thing. <laughs> Do my thing. You know, there is a comment made after one of the, um, the chosen Bible studies that, that Wayne actually led. Somebody said, you know, every single person should have something to share during the sharing of joys and concerns. Every single person. Because it's a time where we share our lives, where we share our witness safely in the sanctuary of our church. We share what God is doing in our lives. So if things are going well for you, there should be some joy that you should be able to share. If things aren't going great, then obviously you have a concern to share. So if you have nothing to share, I might suggest that you check your pulse. Make sure you're still alive. <coughs> Because there's always something that we can share. So if I would suggest now that we move to the joys and concerns, if we fill up the next 15 minutes of sharing joys and concerns with each other, I won't preach because it'll kind of take up my, my sermon time, with one caveat here. This would be sharing joys in your life, struggles in your life, not intercessory prayers for other people. How many takers would I have? Wouldn't have any takers. Isn't that interesting? Why is this such a daunting task? Why is it so scary to share our witness? Why is it that we struggle to share what God is doing in our lives, even in the safe sanctuary of other believers. I'm not sure I understand that. God is doing something in each and every one of our lives. He got you up this morning and he brought you here. That's a joy. Do we recognize that? So yes, I, I say again, we are witnesses to God's action in our lives. So just what is a witness and what does a witness do? When you hear that word witness, what do you think of? This is where we interact. Someone preaching. Someone preaching. 
Court, yeah. Any other thoughts? What does the word witness conjure up in your mind? Anybody picture that person on the, I don't know, at the University of Iowa, it was the quad, where you got the crazy person with the Bible screaming, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> you know, some, some, people, some people picture something like that. Well, good old Merriam-Webster says this, a witness is one that gives evidence, or a witness is testimony of a fact or an event, or it is someone who has personal knowledge of something. When you are a witness, you're officially authenticating that something is true or, or something is, is real or genuine. For example, you see a car accident happen. You witnessed it occur. So you share with the police officer who responds to that accident what you saw. You are saying this is what I saw to be true from where I do, how I viewed that accident. Or sometimes when we engage in some sort of transaction and we need to sign something, we need somebody to witness that we are really who we say we are as we're signing that and they sign as the witness. In our scripture lesson today, we hear the disciples claim that they are witnesses of Jesus. <coughs> This part of this, of this scripture passage is just a small portion of a much bigger passage where the apostles admit to being witnesses, that they are testifying to the events that they saw concerning Jesus. This is what we saw. This is what we must proclaim as true. They were testifying to the new reality of what Easter brings. The reality of freedom in Christ. Freedom from what? First of all, it brings freedom from the law. Romans 7 verse 4 tells us you died to the power of law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. Now, this passage doesn't mean that the Ten Commandments don't apply anymore. But what it does mean is that we are free from the condemnation of the law. I know we all remember John 3, 16. We see it and hear it all the time. But how many of us know the next verse? How many of us know what John 3, 17 says? Does anybody? It says that God sent his son into this world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. We are no longer condemned by the law because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. We are freed from judgment. And we are made perfect through Jesus' death and resurrection. And the result of that freedom is that we now have the ability to produce a harvest for God. But in order to produce that harvest, we have to witness to the effects that Christ has had in our lives. We have to tell others how he's affected us, how he has impacted us. What is it that we are witnessing to? Like I said, we are witnessing to the effect that Jesus had on our life. And we can testify because Jesus does have an impact on each and every one of us. The question is, are we paying attention and do we realize that? It was very interesting. I need to take a little aside here um, because on my way over today, I, I like to listen to a podcast and I would encourage any of you who do listen to podcasts or have access to podcasts, there is one called The Unfolding. And it is exactly what we're talking about today. It's talking about witnessing. Every single interview that this woman does, the person witnesses to the impact of Jesus in their lives. And the person that I listened to today talked about growing up in the church, talked about being a fan of Jesus, but was he really a friend of Jesus? If we have a relationship with Jesus, 
we have been changed by that relationship. Do we pay attention to it? Let's think about it in human terms for a minute here. Think about a person who's had a big impact on your life. Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a grandparent, teacher, a special friend, a boss, a coworker, somebody who's really affected your life. Think about that person. Think about the time that they have spent with you. And because of that time, the difference they've made in your life. I just did a funeral yesterday, and the grandson of the man who had passed away talked about how many of his grandpa's behaviors he saw in himself now. So when we spend that time with somebody that we look up to, they make a difference to us. We start mimicking their behaviors. If we're spending time with Jesus, we should be mimicking him. We should be responding to others the way Jesus responds to us. We should be witnessing to that effect on us. This is why it is so, so, so important that we spend time with Jesus. That we spend time with him praying. We spend time with God reading his word. We spend time, I know we did a whole series over the summer on spiritual disciplines. We spend time building our spiritual muscles so that we are spending time with God, growing that relationship. How many of us here are fans of Jesus? How many of us here are actually friends with Jesus? That we actually spend time with him. It's through that relationship that we learn about him. That we understand who he is. That we understand what he has done for us. And as we do that, we begin to emulate him. And we don't just do it out of rote discipline. We do this because we're supposed to do it. We do it because we're intimately involved with him. He is intimately involved with us in our life. And as we witness or testify Jesus, we do that not only by the way we live, but we also do it by the words that we say. And this is where it gets scary, right? I have to come up with the words to talk about. How do I do that? I don't know what to say. Well, guess what? You don't need to. Because you're not alone in this. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is with you at all times. And the Holy Spirit will give you the right words. The Holy Spirit will give you the right actions to do. I know that there are people sitting here today who have been moved to action by promptings of the Holy Spirit. Where you felt that nudge of the Holy Spirit to do something. Where you were at the store and you noticed that the cashier was having a really bad day. And you were just moved to encourage that person. Or you saw the person in front of you treat them really poorly. And so you, as it's your turn to pay, give them a more uplifting word or an encouraging word. Or you see somebody in front of you in that line who doesn't have enough money to pay for what they bought. And so they're trying to figure out, what do I put back and what do I really need? And, and so you just... Pull a few dollars out of your wallet or your purse and say, here, get, take everything. You know, we all have had those things. Think about a time when you have felt that Holy Spirit nudging you. Have you responded? How did you respond? Did you respond by acting or saying something? Or did you respond by ignoring that? We all have those. Sometimes it's easy to move when the Spirit says move. Sometimes it's not so easy. It's, it's easy to give an encouraging word. Sometimes as you do that, though, you run into, into difficulties with that. You, you start questioning, okay, should I say something? Should I not say something? I'm like, you know what, I'm just not going to say something because maybe the next person will. It's easy to do that. Sometimes it's a challenge to testify because faced with really tough situations. Someone might not be in a place to hear that encouragement that you're giving to them. Or maybe the encouragement you give is not well received or it's outright rejected. I 
had that experience this week. Not everybody accepts that, okay? Maybe you've heard the, why is God punishing me? Why did God put me in this situation? Again, I lived through that this week. We have those difficult conversations. And you know what? There could be a lot of different reasons that that person's in that situation. It is not your job to come up with an excuse for God. It's not your job to validate their reactions against God. It's not your job to justify whatever behaviors that they're doing. It's your job to be there with them. Maybe, just maybe, you are in that place dealing with this person who is responding this way because there was a time in your past when you were in that darkness and despair. And so your response can be, you know what, I don't know, I've never experienced what you're experiencing, but I've been in dark places, and this is how I've dealt with it. We are testifying to the truth of Jesus, so we must remain true. Another tough situation that we often find ourselves is, I've prayed and God just isn't listening to me. Let me ask you this question and be honest. How many of you here have had a time where God was silent in your life? I'm guessing that if we were honest, every single one of us would raise our hand. There are times where we just don't hear. So maybe from your experience in that time, God was preparing you to interact and respond to this person who is saying, God isn't listening to me. Why keep praying God isn't listening? Maybe when you've shared your faith in the past, you've had the response of, I don't believe in God. Or don't even talk to me about this God. During those times, you know, we can still encourage others by praying for them. And I don't mean saying, I will pray for you. I mean saying, I'm going to pray for you right now. Doesn't have to be a long prayer. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can simply be a prayer of, Lord God, would you please show yourself to this person in a very real way? Open their hearts so they can see you. Holy Spirit's going to provide the words. You don't need to worry about that, but pray with them in that moment. Don't say, I'm going to pray for you, because you know what? They're not going to believe you, especially if they're in a place of hurt. And as you're praying and as you're talking to them, don't make promises that you can't control. You can control, I will pray with you, and I will continue to pray for you. But don't make promises that you don't know God, what God because God, you don't know what God has in store. So don't make promises, God's going to heal you. God will, will heal them, but maybe what they hear is, God's going to make my illness go away, and I'm going to be well and healthy tomorrow. That might not be what God has in plan. So don't make promises that you can't keep. And always remember that the Holy Spirit is going to be with you as you witness. One more note. Don't expect immediate changes in their situation, in their reaction to you. Because God doesn't always work that way. Sometimes miracles happen. Sometimes an immediate change happens. But a lot of times it doesn't. And a lot of times people will continue to be upset with you and upset with God because their situations don't change. If we take another look at our scripture today, you'll see that even the disciples faced rejection, right? And so when we're witnessing to people and they're rejecting our witness, remind yourself, the disciples and Jesus all faced rejection also. We're fortunate in our communities today that we don't face um, beatings, death, imprisonment for talking to somebody about how much God loves them. But we will be rejected. That Jesus promises this. John 15, 18 to 19 says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. 
The world would love you as, as one of its own if you belonged to it, but you're no longer part of this world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. So when you share about Jesus, there will be times when you will be rejected. Be prepared for that. Jesus goes on to explain that they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting him. In verse 21 of chapter 15 in John, they will do all of this because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. People who reject God won't necessarily accept us as agents, as his agents here, right, or his witnesses. But then Jesus continues with a bit of encouragement. In John 15, 26, he said, I will, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And finally, he finishes his conversation with his followers in 20, verse 27. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. We can testify to the changed reality of Easter because we have been part of Jesus' ministry as well. Each and every one of us have been part of his ministry. We have come into a personal relationship with Jesus, and we can testify on his behalf to the world in our everyday lives to everyday people. I recognize that there are probably many of us sitting here who could relate to this man that I listened to this morning about being fans of Jesus rather than friends of Jesus. If you're struggling to find that personal connection, that personal relationship with Jesus, to have that deep, meaningful relationship with him, I encourage you to talk to me or to talk to Pastor Wayne about that so that we can work through that together, you have, so that you will have prayer warriors supporting that growth of that relationship. But I encourage you, if you don't have that relationship, you can't be witness to it. So start there. My challenge for you this week, then, is to reflect on that relationship. Where are you in your relationship with God the Father, with Jesus his Son, and with the Holy Spirit? Where does that relationship stand? Do you feel that you can testify to the truth of Jesus? If not, what can you do to put yourself in a position where you can testify to his truth? And if you can testify, if you do have that solid relationship with Jesus, what will you do this week to share that witness with somebody else? Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you are a constant presence in our life, that you do deeply desire a relationship with each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to seek that relationship, to grow that relationship with you, and then to boldly be able to share that witness and that testimony with others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our hymn of response today is number, I can't read this, 389, um, Freely, Freely.
that we normally take up our offering, just a reminder the plate is still in the back. Um, so in response of the thanks that we have for the blessings that he gives, we will respond with the doxology. portion of those blessings back to you and we ask that you bless these now Lord help us to use them to make disciples to boldly witness and to grow your kingdom here on earth amen <coughs> since you didn't take me up on the sharing of joys and concerns for the sermon um, I invite you now to share anything you have this morning So prayers for Steve's family, a friend who passed away, and prayers for Catherine because her pain has returned. And it's, it's really bad. Prayers for Nancy and her comfort. Prayers for Nancy, comfort for her. And Jerry and the rest of the family, I might add. I would like to lift up a friend named Karen. Um, I spoke with her via text last night, and she informed me that she was in the hospital last week, and her heart is functioning at less than 50%. So I asked her for permission to put her on prayer lists, and she said that was fine. She loved that. So Anybody else? Nobody's going to share a joy of what God's done in their life. Nobody's going to share anything personal. Yes, ma'am. So I'm just going to share a joy that I would have had earlier today. That this is a day that the Lord has made, and we should rejoice in it and be glad for every day that we have. Yes. I feel like I just need to sing that song now. Yeah. <laughs> this is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. I liked, I liked the Trinity Lutheran version of that because they would always say, we will rejoice and be glad in it. So they would like really rejoice in that word. <coughs> Anybody else? All right, let's go to God in prayer then. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, this is a day that you have made and we will rejoice. We will be so grateful that you have led us here today, that you're a part of our lives, that you are wooing us to you. You want a relationship with us. You are pursuing us. Open our hearts and our minds and our, and our ears and our eyes and everything so that we might see that pursuit, that we might feel that pursuit and that we might respond to that pursuit. 
so that we can be effective witnesses for you. We're so grateful, Lord, for the changing seasons, for the sun that's been out, for the warmer weather that's been out, for the budding flowers and trees that we see. We know that's all by your hand, God, and we are so very, very grateful for that. We also ask you, Lord, in great humility to be with those who need your healing touch, to be with Catherine, to be with Karen, or to be with Nancy and the rest of the Nord family as she struggles with end-of-life issues. And Lord, we ask that you be with Steve's family as they deal with death. We ask you to be with the Noe family as they just laid a loved one to rest yesterday. You know our pain, God. You've been through it. But you also know that there is joy in the morning. You do know that Christ, that you did rise, raise Christ from the dead. That because of this Easter message, we are Easter people. We live in that resurrection. We do have hope, despite the hardships, Lord, and we are so very grateful for that hope. Lord, I ask as we go on this week, that each of us examines our relationship with you. That we truly desire to be your friend rather than your fan. That we want to spend time with you. And as we do that, you will increase our bravery so that we may be bold witnesses for you. Lord, we come to you now with the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, <coughs> as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 572, Pass It On.
Would you receive the benediction today? May the God of love, peace, and joy touch your hearts today. May you be encouraged to build that relationship, and may you have the boldness to share it with someone this week. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.